Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Forgotten Feminists. Um, today, we are very lucky to have the absolutely gorgeous Dalal with us. Dalal has an article in the Irish Times that I shared on my Twitter. Um, but if you haven't read it, that's okay, because you're going to learn all about her today. She is an amazing young woman who grew up in the US and in Saudi Arabia, but she is currently living in Ireland with her Belgian husband, Eric. So she's truly an international woman. Thank you so much for joining us here, Delal. It is an absolute pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So I wanted to start off by asking you about your childhood growing up. I mean, Saudi Arabia and the United States yeah. of America, you couldn't possibly find two more different cultures to grow yeah. up in. I can imagine you probably had whiplash from the culture shock. Oh my gosh, totally. So tell me about that. What was Especially it like back growing in the up? 90s. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it froze. Oh. Oh no. Okay, I can hear you now. Okay, good. My Wi-Fi has been terrible. Um, Whiplash. Yeah. 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 So tell me about what it was like to grow up in, in those two different cultures. Um, all right. So um, I was born in 1990. Uh, first five years of my life were spent in Saudi Arabia in Jeddah. I come from a very conservative um, Muslim background. Uh, in particular, my mom was the one who was hyper conservative, hyper strict. Uh, then we moved to, to the States for one year and that's when I picked up the language. Moved back to Saudi Arabia and then 1999 we moved back to the States where I stayed there for up until 2005. So pre-teen, early teenage years, those formative years were spent in the States. So pre-teen, you're in the States, and then you go to Saudi Arabia as yeah. you were, how old were you again? You said 13? I would have been uh, 15. We went back to oh, Saudi 15. Arabia. So that would have been 2005. And like I had a couple of years um, until I was able to finish high school and go into college. So going at 15, I assume that's when, you know, at this point, probably hijab has been introduced to you. Like that's when you're a woman. Now you're ready to get married at 15. <laughs> So I imagine there must have been quite the shock for you going from such an open society to all of a sudden going to a gender segregated society and there's all of these restrictions on you. Is that true? Yeah. What was it like? Absolutely. So um, I'll touch on, for example, when I was forced uh, made to wear the hijab. So I would have been 13 at the time and it was just because I'd gotten my period. So literally my mom was like, you're a woman now. And um, come this summer, I was allowed to finish finish off the school year with my without this like major change. Uh, so that summer, she said I have to start wearing the hijab, and I remember being very very anxious about it, and also not wanting to wear it. But my mom was like very strict and like the way that she taught me the religion was if you do not do this, you will rot in hell. Mm -hmm. um, she taught me of a, unfortunately, a merciless um, God, a vengeful God. Um, and I, I know it's, that's not everyone's view of their religion. That's not how everybody practices their religion. I'm just explaining what it was like with my mom in particular. So when I was forced to put on the hijab, I also that summer, we ended up moving to a new state because we just kept bouncing around from one state to the other. And it honestly isolated me. I was very self-conscious. I was, I had no self-esteem. And to top that off with making me wear the hijab and feeling even more out of place as a teenager was insanely difficult. I felt I identified as American as well. I used to always say I'm Saudi by birth, but American in spirits. I identified with American values and um, the way of life and freedom in particular, freedom of choice, but I had none of that at home or growing up. Yeah, of course. Um, what were your sort of your other family members, like your cousins and, and people in your immediate circle yeah. in Saudi Arabia, like were they um, 
when you would tell them, like, I feel like I'm American or something like that, like, how was the, what were the responses like? Um, so uh, on my mom's side of the family, I was the eldest of all my cousins. Um, the youngest one was, or the second oldest was many, many years younger. So I did not have a relationship with them. Um, neither did I have a relationship or a strong relationship where I could um, vent or even bond with any of my mother's relatives, particularly because we were living in the States most of the year. And then we would travel uh, to visit in the summer. Uh, same case with my dad's family, but um, to be fair, they seemed more uh, open-minded, more reasonable, more moderate. Um, and the my cousins from my dad's side of the family were not subject to such strict religious um, implementation as I was, not from my view um, anyway. And again, I was not close with any of them. I just felt like an outsider. I was a broken soul. I mm. could not bond with them either. Uh, we did not visit them very often. I suspect that was my mom's just my mom's hand in all of it. She didn't really approve of them at all. Mm. So um, Michelle, who has joined us here today, had a harrowing story when she was um, my guest on Forgotten Feminist, where she told us about the religious police. Now they were you know, up and about around those times when you were in Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah. Hopefully you didn't have any interactions with them or anything like that. No. Um, Good. When we went back to Saudi, it was 2015. I, I had no life. It was either being perpetually grounded at home or I went to school. And my school was my relief and my escape, even though I didn't really quite integrate with the students there, being too westernized for them. And school was just an escape from home life. That's really it. I relate to that 100%. Um, and I relate to this next question I'm gonna ask you too. So you were now 18 years old um, yeah. and you go, you're in Saudi Arabia at this point, and yeah. your parents push you into a marriage with a man who is 10 years older than you. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, because you read my book that I had a similar situation where I was 19 and he was 15 years older. Now, there's something about girls like us that are raised in the West. There's this um, assumption that we don't get forced into marriages that that's only the kind of thing that happens you know in Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan or you know and it's it's really hard to explain to somebody that the geography is not as significant as you think it is the way we get forced into marriages we're not there's not a gun to our head you know so obviously your marriage um was against your will can you talk to us a little bit about how does an American woman accept to be married to some guy that's 10 years older than her? Like what was, um, uh, you know, what are, what, tell me about the coercive methods, how that ended up happening. Uh, I'll give you an example from my childhood in the, in the States um, before we dive into my, the forced marriage. But for example, I remember I would have been maybe uh, 14, 13, possibly 15 at most, I had a Saudi friend and she was a girl of uh, my age as well. And the we one way or the other, my parents found out that this girl had called the cops on her parents for allegedly um, being abused by them or her father in particular. And my mom was telling me the story and it was from like the point of view of this, this girl is totally going to hell. I mean, how dare she disrespect her parents like that? Her parents are like second place after God. She should be um, at their beck and call 24 seven. You're never allowed to um, go against your parents' will. And that was kind of like their way, my mom's way in particular of maneuvering and like drilling into my head that I am never allowed to seek help from anybody else, not even from the cops. Um, so, and I remember feeling like that there was something wrong about that. You, you call the cops for help. 
Mm -hmm. um, how could it be wrong for a child to call the cops even if it was about their parents? If they need help at the end of the day, um, they should be saved and helped or protected. Um, but it did ingrain in me the feeling of isolation and loneliness and it kind of it caused a divide like even though I feel American I am not entitled to the benefits of living in an American society um, that was a profound moment in my life and I do recall it in some of my videos as being just one of those moments that had I been taught differently, or even in school, that I can actually go to the police and there's nothing wrong in doing that, I probably would have many, many years ago when my parents would probably be in a ton of trouble because they are quite violent. They were physically violent, in particular my mom, um, emotionally violent. Um, I was starved during the months of Ramadan. I mean, they call it fasting, but it wasn't for a child. Um, it, it was just like, okay, it's Ramadan, um, get up, have your suhoor, and then you have to pa fast or else you'll go to hell. Uh, excuse me. Literally, in my home life, there was nothing in relation to, for example, the philosophy of fasting or why other points of view in relation to fasting or um, whatever profoundness people attach to Ramadan and fasting yeah yeah no i totally get that there's no there's no spiritual element to it there's Absolutely. no yeah yeah there's no you know they tell you it's so that you can know what poor people feel like like we're not doing anything to help poor people we're not going to soup kitchens we're not like helping homeless we're not doing anything we're just seven eight-year-old kids being starved <laughs> like you know it doesn't make any sense and and it's yeah. and in, in a lot of a lot of the things of the religion are like that, you know, like a, like hijab, memorizing Quran, prayer, fasting, all of these things are forced on you in such an aggressive manner. And then it's like, love Allah. I know. <laughs> How am I going to love this guy? He's brought me nothing but misery you know, yeah. love him or he's going to burn you for eternity and you're going to suffer in the grave and the punishments and, the, you know, and then you're supposed to feel all of this, you know, spiritual transcendence. Like, you know, it, it, it's just so, it doesn't make any sense. Like, of course, if you're going to whip children to pray or whip children to um, memorize put on or whatever it is that you're whipping them for they're not going to be endeared towards whatever that thing is you know yeah yeah there I just posted an article about in Malaysia people are not only not allowed to eat but if non-Muslim people are known to help them get food <laughs> during Ramadan those non-Muslim people can be punished as well like it's like leave people alone if people want to eat they can eat if they don't want to eat they don't want eat it's between them and their god like just it's just control it's just constant control yeah. all the time okay so now tell me about the the marriage and how that situation happened mm -hmm. uh so I would have been I got engaged at 18 and I remember that very clearly it was a January but anyway um the way that I was approached my mom basically said that she got a call from this woman and I had been like proposed to through my family many times but my mom was the one that always that would deem whether they were a good fit or not um so she deemed this young man was um a good fit for me she liked the family that they come that he comes from and she liked the mother um their um level of religious conservatism um aligned with ours so that was also a big um uh, criteria for my mother also she was married off when she was like 17 uh, or she had me when she was 17 and she was married when she was 16 so i the way that I see it, she was just perpetuating a cycle. This is what it was like for her, for her grandma, for her her mother, maybe grandmother as well, likely. And she just needed to. Um, it, it was time for me to carry on um, with that as well. Uh, so 
I remember uh, expressing my, and I remember being absolutely petrified and saying that, no, I don't want to. I want to continue to get my bachelor's, bachelor's degree and travel abroad, um, get a master's and marriage was not on my radar at all, particularly because nobody around me seemed to be in a happy uh, relationship or a happy marriage. My parents were in a happy marriage. So my entire view of marriage was um, shackles and misery and why in the world would I want to be in that state too. Um, so the, the response that I got when I tried to express uh, that I did not want to get married at 18, 19, um, it was, I am disobedient, I am lazy. That was the biggest thing. Um, we've provided you everything like food and clothing and the best schools and travel and you're so spoiled right now. Um, what else do you want from life? And if I express that I wanted to get an education, I wanted to travel and um, pursue independence, um, I got yelled at for that. I've been beaten as well because I am such a, what's the, because I'm too Westernized. My mom would say, you're too Americanized. And she tried to beat that out of me. Um, my father accused me of being a lesbian um, when I, because I remember I was t t like, I don't want to marry him. And I saw the pictures of the guy and I was like, I'm not attracted, I'm disgusted. And he shot back with, well, are you a lesbian? I was, I was dumbfounded. like. What does that have to do with anything? But was, no, I'm not a lesbian. And he was like, well, then you have no excuse. No one ever asked me about what I wanted to do, what I viewed my life, um, what I wanted from my life, what my goals, my ambitions were. Um, if we were even compatible on a personal level, um, what were her, his hobbies, his passions? Um, what does he expect from a, from a wife or what I expected from a husband if I wanted one? None of that was discussed. It was just, are they compatible as a, a general family and their status in our society? Um, and all right, Delal is of age and um, I met his... Um, likely list of demands. I want her to be around this height, um, mm. hair length. Uh, I want this to be the background that she comes from. And that was it. There's something really interesting that you touched on there that I want to just examine a little bit. When you talked about nobody ever asked you, you know, like the, the personal compatibility. Yeah. Now, I found that I never even asked myself those questions. Like I didn't even view myself as a real human worthy of saying, these are the kinds of things that I want. First of all, I was mm. too young to even think about it, but, or to even know who I was or what I wanted, but there was no question about like, do you want to go to college or what career do you want to have? Or how do you, see your future like none of not I was never asked it but I also never asked myself those questions either did you find it was the same for you like you're just kind of like as a daughter just property like your responsibility sorry yeah we're a property I was a yes. property I was yeah. I mean, my entire life was laid out in front of me, even the clothes that I were to, to wear, um, everything. I literally, I cannot stress it enough. I had no life. I had no friends. Um, it was just me and my thoughts and whatever I could access online. And, but I, I knew deep down, or it was just quite obvious to me that I wanted my independence and I wanted my freedom and nothing was going to stop me from achieving that. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I wasn't asked about what I wanted out of my own life was just, it was, it was expected. It, I yeah. didn't expect anything other than that. You're not even allowed to complain. Like you said, like that girl that called the cops on her family that were physically yeah. abused. You're not even allowed to complain when you are being physically abused or starved or whatever it is. Like you are such a, 
you're like you said, you're just property and you don't get to have an opinion on your own life. Yeah, a psychiatrist actually accused me. She was um, uh, Egyptian Muslim psychiatrist in Saudi Arabia. I was after I think a year or so of the marriage, I kept protesting and protesting and saying that I wanted the divorce. Um, so they got it in their heads, um, some of the family members, including my mom, that I, the evil eye was cast upon me or oh, I would do it. Or a or gin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, or that I was just mentally unstable. So my mom uh, had me go to a, a psychologist, uh, sorry, not psychiatrist. And she was one of her friends in university, I believe, or something like that. And we did a series of sessions. And at the end of the session, I the conclusion was, or I think it was like a total of six or 12 sessions or whatever. But um, she saw that there was, I was not willing to waver from my stance that I wanted to get a divorce. I was no way going to have children from this man or with this man. And um, one of her last words to me was in a very accusatory tone. It was like, all you want to do is just travel and get an education. And mm -hmm. like, you must be insane. You're so selfish. It was. And I, I, and I remember sh shooting back at her like, yeah, this is what I want out of life. <laughs> What's wrong with that? All you want to <laughs> do is be an independent human being, making your own decisions. Yeah, <laughs> like... yeah. yeah. Oh, um, so but it was, I, I remember that so clearly because it was also one of the moments when I, my um, resistance could just kept strengthening despite everything even though I mean I was literally between like two hells either being with my husband and then being forced to have children and being forced to carry on in a life that I did not want the man was also very much abusive or going back to a home life with my parents with my mom in particular with all kinds of abuse as well not a, like both were two evils, but I guess being with my parents was the lesser of two evils. At least I wasn't getting sexually abused by my husband. Um, that was kind of the one that went out and that let me try and uh, pursue the divorce. Oh my gosh. I'm so, so glad that you got out of that horrible Thank you. situation yeah. that you were in literally between two hells. Like I can't, oh. It makes my stomach turn. Um, so you've mentioned your mom a couple times and mm -hmm. how her control over you was so manipulative and devious. And I've talked mm -hmm. about my relationship with my mom and my book. And we had another um, woman on our show named Rada who was telling us about her mom as well. It just seems to be like this common thing with us. And I'm get, I get messages from girls in Iran and Somalia and Turkey and other countries as well. So it's not as Arab as I used to think it was. It seems to be more of a, you know, Islamic world kind of thing. But there's, I have a theory that I talk about in my book, right? Like about this thing about women not having any control in their lives and they can't exert any kind of power over anyone else except for their daughters. I mean, even their sons, yeah. they can't, certainly not their husbands, certainly not anyone else in society. Um, and so it seems to be that we get the brunt of their wrath, which is mm -hmm. so tragic to me because I find myself now as a mother of two daughters, I am so... I want them to have the polar opposite life that I had. And I want to be the polar opposite mother that I had. So it's just so weird to me that none of these moms clue into that and think to themselves, oh, wait, like your mom, for example, I got married off when I was 17. Did I like it? Was I happy? Why, why would you want to perpetuate this generational trauma? Like, why, why don't they stop and say, okay, you know what? maybe we shouldn't continue this things like FGM and child marriage like women are doing these things to other women mothers are doing it to their daughters um, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to 
you know, pick your brain a little bit about that relationship between mother and daughter. And if you had any thoughts on that. I, because I've done a lot of inner child therapy. So I'm inclined to say that it's unresolved trauma. And mm. I think, well, well, from my personal experience, I think my mom has, I suspect she's got issues that are unresolved and she doesn't have any desire of resolving them as, as well either. Um, and there's, uh, it's gotta be to do with the way that she was raised. And I suspect that she was not shown the love and affection that she so badly desired when she was a child. Um, that's why she was not able to provide me with that love and affection. Um, luckily for me, I had a godsend of a an angel of a woman who raised me from the day that I was six years old, uh, six days old, till I was about six years old. She was a Filipina woman um, that my parents hired uh, when I was first born, and she was the woman that actually nurtured me and mothered me the way that I needed to be mothered. Um, year many years later, it was actually maybe about two or three years ago when we got back in contact um, and she would tell me about what childhood what her time was like with me and she said that when your mom would um, cross her boundaries and like she would abuse me she would stand up on my behalf and she would stop my mom and tell her like if you hurt Delal, if Delal cries I cry too mm -hmm. um, it came out in therapy that there was a there was a huge wound that I was not even aware of um, because that was my mother and that was the mother that left my life at six years old. Um, perhaps that could be why I've grown up to be a woman that is the polar opposite of my mother. Maybe that's why I'm capable of um, expressing feelings of empathy and compassion and also wanting to stop the cycle. That is my theory on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because as well, like when I look at my, from my dad's side of the family, I have a bunch of cousins, bless them all. They're all about my age, several girls that are around my age and they have great relationships with their, with their mothers. They're close with them. They are not afraid of their mothers the way that I was. And I wonder why that is. And um, it must be to do with the way that they're treated. And that must be because the way their mothers were treated was with love and compassion rather than religious extremism. I hope so. I know that if anybody would have commented on my relationship with my mom, they would have said that the two of us were very close because I was essentially, I would do anything in this world for her love. I would do anything in this world for her affection and her approval. I mean, I, I did, I did do everything. I took it to the absolute limit until I was entirely diminished. Um, for her and it's that it's all about heaven being at the feet of your mothers you know and uh, you have yeah, to yeah. you have to have you have to honor your family you have to honor your parents and you know you being the girl there's such a responsibility with carrying the family honor and uh -huh. um yeah I took that really seriously and I was scared of going to hell and I knew that she was my ticket to heaven. And I really mm -hmm. just, you know, ha not ha having, because I didn't have a dad, she was like my only parent. So it was so important to me that I have her love. Otherwise I don't have any love. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that your cousins really do have good relationships with their moms, but yeah. you know, mm -hmm we were, my mom and I were super tight, but it was certainly not healthy by, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, yeah. I'm just now recalling bits of your, where you talk about that in your book. Cause it's been like a number of years. I think I read it as soon as it came out. So some details escape me, but also I never bonded with my mother. Like I said, it, it was a mm. Filipino that raised mm -hmm. me. Um, so literally zero bond, not even from infancy. Um, and also I, yeah, I don't like to use the word rebel, but I guess 
I did, I had a very deeply ingrained, unwavering sense of this is wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't buy into it. But at the same time, I could not figure out what was wrong about it because my parents are both PhD graduates um, raised or they went to some of the best schools in the country. So in my eyes, as a teen and a child, like they're smart, they know what they're doing, but it felt so deeply wrong. And I never mm -hmm. understood why until after moving to Ireland and getting into therapy and realizing this is, this is core gut instincts trying to um, get you out of the, the hellhole that I was in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell me about, tell me about your life today. Tell me about your relationship yeah. with your family, how it stands today, how they um, reacted to your infidel husband <laughs> and oh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the fact that you are not only not wearing hijab and living as this independent woman and everything, but you're involved in powerlifting competitions. Mm -hmm. Like you're doing some very, some very Arab things, Dela. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but there's a lot to that. Okay, so where do I start? Um, when I moved, when I moved to Ireland, uh, 2015, it was under the pretense that I was gonna get my master's degree and then go back to Saudi Arabia. Soon before I moved to, or the year before I moved to Ireland, um, Eric and I met originally online, but like in person, face to face in Saudi Arabia. Um, at that time, it would have been 2014 when we met. 2013 was um, when I got my divorce finally. And it was also, I remember it very clearly because it was the 13th of March, 2013, I got my divorce papers and it was also the last time I saw my mom. Um, like she had beat me and um, I was at her mother's house um, and I remember we exchanged words and she said like I disown you and I said I disown you too um, mm -hmm. and then that was the last uh, time I saw her so though so all of that to say that she has not been a part of my life since 2013 um, she was very upset that I had gotten the divorce and that I wasn't interfering with the breakdown of my mother's divorce with my father. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the last things as well that day that I told I was like, mom, it took you like 20 something years for you guys to build up this mess. It's up to you guys to handle it. I'm out of it. Um, she couldn't stand because she, um, anyway. Um, so when I moved, when I moved to Ireland, things were already starting to break down between me and my dad. Um, my dad had took a back seat um, my entire life. It, my mom was the one that uh, quote unquote tried to raise me. Um, so when my parents separated, I stayed with my dad and my dad perpetuated an image of being open-minded and liberal and flexible and whatever. And he was at that time also 2013, he was like, Dalal, if you want to take off the hijab, then it's okay by me. Um, of course, I did that. <laughs> you know, like mm. we were in the state, and <laughs> um, I did that right away. He gave me a mini speech of your twenty. What well, I was, I would have been 23, 24 at the, the time. It's like you're twenty something years old. Um, you should be making your own decisions. I said, wow, I'm very surprised, but okay. My dad did claim to be like a, a liberal our entire lives, but um, it was my mom's say. Um, it was her word was over anything and everything. Uh, my dad had, did not have any say in our family home and our family dynamic. So um, anyway, yeah. So 2013, 2014, I very soon after I meet Eric, I don't know, it just something happened. He's the first man I ever dated. He's the, I did not even have marriage on my mind, in my head, I was gonna go get my master's and then just start off the, my life as a young independent woman. But he comes into my life and we both fall head over here, heels for each other. And I go to my dad and um, I was very upfront with him from the very beginning. I told him about Eric. I don't think it registered with him because I never showed interest in boys or men. But oh, you still thought you were a lesbian. 
Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, so when I, I invited Eric over to our home, my dad met him. And then all of a sudden, it was like a, slit, a switch that just flipped in him. And it became about what are, what's the family going to say? Uh, what are like uh, the society people around us going to say? My, da my daughter is marrying an infidel because he was a non-Muslim at the time, even mm -hmm. though um, we, he knew that, of course, he was going to convert to Islam if he were to marry me in Saudi Arabia. Um, but it became about what are gonna, people going to say? They're going to call me a bitch if I dis decided to marry this um, Western man. Um, so it was all about optics. And I remember as well, my dad was very abusive, but I did not recognize his abuse because it was very subtle. Um, and the things that he would say and do and um, very rarely physically violent. Um, so I did not pick up on his behavioral issues till after I moved to Ireland. Um, but I had a nagging feeling because I kept saying that there was something wrong with my dad. And I even went to a life coach and I explained about um, his behavior and his attitude. I think he's a narcissist like to the highest degree, but um, I did not realize that at the time. But when I did eventually move to Ireland in preparing to come here, I remember taking all of my papers, like birth certificates and what I deemed were very important legal documents, because there was something in my gut that was like, Delal, this might be the last time um, you might not come back. This might be the last time you travel out of Saudi Arabia. That ended up being the case. A few months later, um, shit hit the fan basically with my dad. And he was, um, it got so bad that, my, that Eric, who was in Saudi at the time, called his embassy and he said, you know, should anything happen to me, then you know who to shine a light on. And because of my dad's status in the society and he was in the Saudi National Guard at the time and like uh, very high ranking, we truly did fear um, for his life or for his safety. Um, also, the things that he would say to me were so not okay. I took those recordings to a university psychiatrist also during that time. It was very soon after I moved to Ireland. And I remember his response. He was like, he was so freaking alarmed that he asked for my um, signature and approval to call the cops it, because of them, what he was saying. And it caused me to spiral into like an emotional and um, uh, mental breakdown. But it was like so normal to me. I mm -hmm. did not recognize how not okay um, I was being treated, not only those past months or years, but my entire life. Um, I come out of the psychiatrist's office um, one day as well. I filed police reports and I, um, and I remember in the, in the meeting with the psychiatrist, I'm like, am I demonizing my dad? He said, no. Am I victimizing myself? He said, no. Am I exaggerating this whole thing? And he said, no. I left that meeting and I said, Eric, I'm not going back. If we want our relationship to continue, then he's going to have to move. And he knew that was on the table. That could be a possible outcome. And he was like, okay. Um, a month later, he was in Ireland. Now Aww. that is a very like skimmed short and like yes, yeah, of course, one two hours about what like all of the bits and events that mm -hmm. happened, but it was insane. I cannot believe I actually like all the while I was trying to get a master's degree and get through my <sighs> school. Like how I did that is beyond me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. I really related to what you said about things, the abuse and the everything being so normalized that you don't even recognize it. Like I, I, I remember that moment where you're sometimes like telling somebody like whether it's a therapist or a friend, and then you like watch their face contort in horror and you're like, oh, yeah. I guess that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> but you just you're have. Yeah, but during one of the recordings, I recorded my dad on the phone um, when I was in Ireland because I wanted to take it to somebody else and be like, mm -hmm. am I insane? Am I exaggerating? Yeah. Or, and my friend, she was actually my um, roommate at the time as well. She was sitting there 
um, next to me offering me moral support. And I remember the look on her face, like, okay, oh, okay, so this is serious. So I'm not exaggerating over here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was quite validating what I was told that, no, you, sh you should report this. And if this man sets a foot in this country, then he will be arrested. Um, it was so validating. It was mm -hmm. one of the most important moments of my life. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so glad. And I'm so glad you had Eric with you so soon after to help you process yeah. everything because to go through that alone I mean you'd already gone through it alone long enough you know yeah your whole life but basically of actually um severing ties and being like I'm I'm done I have to start a new life and end this um trauma um I couldn't have done it without him he's a true blessing so um, I've opened it up to the whole group here and in the chat, the first question is about Eric. Yeah. <laughs> Eric uh, is asking, um, so he didn't need to convert in the end, I guess, because he came to Ireland. You weren't in Saudi. Yeah. In Saudi Arabia, because we were, we genuinely had a goal of just marrying and settling down in Saudi. And if he were, we were to marry, he had to convert. So he was also genuinely before he met me, was considering converting to Islam and he was like taking courses and going to sheikhs and all of that. So yes, he did convert actually. Mm. Yeah. I wrote about it in my book, but I also, there was a, a man that I was married to before my current husband and after the one that I was forced to marry. And he also converted to Islam. And it was really funny when he met my mom the first time, because he was so horrified. And I said to him, but I told you, like, I told you what she was like. He's like, yeah, but, but I had no idea. Like he just, She wouldn't meet him until he converted, of course. All right, uh, so let's open it up to the group here. I know that there are a lot of women here that relate to the, what you've been talking about, Dalal. Um, Michelle grew up in Saudi Arabia as well. And so she probably, you know, the two of you connect on, on that level. So um, if anybody has any questions or comments for Dalal, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Hi, Daral. Hola. Hi. And, uh, I got to say, I'm very glad to hear your story. I'm very happy about that. I just want to go back to the mother-daughter thing. I just kind of have this weird logical explanation. Mm -hmm. I guess it could be right. It could not. I don't know. So basically, I think the reason mothers are behaving like this is because they receive con continuous shame for their daughters mm. and like for example my mom has were four sisters and and three brothers but she had like her daughters mm -hmm. and then there was my aunt her sister who has three sons only and every time everyone would tell the sister you are so lucky you don't have to have any shame and right in front of my mom and right in front of all of us so I guess that's why mothers know that you are there to just cause her shame and, and, and all of this insults and everything. So they just hate you, yeah. I guess. I think that's my only logical explanation. You're just a burden to them. Yeah, I definitely brought shame to my mother by living the way that I do and also by divorcing the man that she forced me to marry. Um, I think maybe pride, her, she de she derives pride by the way that she raises her kids and or how her kids turn out in life. Of course. Yeah. Um, but I go back to being very s certain that she's unstable, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Uh, that could make sense, too. Yeah. Thank I you. Kind of have... <laughs> I, I, I think that's a really great theory, Michelle, and I completely can see that, like just the pressure, the constant pressure from, you know, Ines and like just the, you know, the family honor and people are talking and the neighbors and the whatever, like you just, 
the pressure is on them and it's because of you. So what you said about us being just a burden, like we're causing them this anxiety. So yeah, I think you, yeah, you guys are very right to like emphasize um, peer pressure and social pressure. Um, uh, Cause uh, it just, I was just reminded by my Arab friends. So I have um, an Arab friend that's very near and dear to me here in Ireland. And she had recently come back from a holiday in her home country, also in the middle, middle East. And one of the first things that she said to me like in conversation was like, I'm so relieved to be back. Like it's all back in our home country. It's all about it's um, peer pressure. And mm. this person said that, and this is what's being told about you and so on and so forth. It's never ending and it's mentally and emotionally exhausting. And it must be on a, another level um, in the cultures that we come from. Mm -hmm. I do wonder was, about it. That was one thing I really did notice very strongly and I, you probably did too, when you're going from America to Saudi and then back to America again, like when I went to Egypt, I really noticed this, the pressure felt almost physical because when you're in Canada, it's not like that. Like you don't, there's the circle of, of people are not so involved in your every single aspect of your life, the way that they are in Egypt. Yeah. And so I was, I would always be so relieved to get out of that like it just it felt like a physical weight off your shoulders to not have just to be have people constantly you know scrutinizing your every move yeah I did not succumb to that or I didn't feel it because partly I was not aware of it partly because I had no life nothing to be scrutinized um mm -hmm. but I see it in my friends who travel back home and then come back and express their relief um mm -hmm. and um what was I gonna say my the, I just felt extremely uncomfortable um when I moved back I never really understood why but I remember the very last year I spent in Saudi all I could say over and over was I do not feel safe here um and it was very very important for me to regain a sense of safety that's all I wanted mm. to feel um coming here in Ireland to Ireland or like settling here um, helped me regain that sense of safety and it's really really important if you don't feel safe mm -hmm. where you are how are you supposed to um, uh, like achieve and progress in life yeah I get that for sure I mean it's your first thing in your Maslow's hierarchy of needs right so oh, really? yeah I don't know it yeah. might be maybe after food <laughs> It's got to be yeah, down yeah. there somewhere down low because yeah it is really important and I and I did I, I felt that when I was living in Egypt and also when I was living in Qatar too just this constant state of unrest because you're not in a in a in a in a democracy you're not in a safe country you're you are a second class citizen you are um and especially when I was in Qatar because I didn't want it to come out that I wasn't a Muslim anymore because that's, you know, a capital offense. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do know what you mean by that um, safety. Okay, Erkan. Sorry, I just uh, <laughs> took me a second there. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Dalal. Um, for a great talk again and um, welcome to the west hope you uh, feel happy in ireland and um yeah i just wanted to come in on this um this you know woman as kind of primary carer sort of thing and it's that kind of it's it's cleverly written into the religion isn't it you know because it's you know because because they realize that maybe that because structure and you know the Things like structure and solidarity and morality are kind of really important to, you know, uh, religions. And so I think, like Yasmin said about heaven at the feet of the mother, it's kind of cleverly written into the, the, the scripture, isn't it? And, uh, you know, because, you know, the woman is the primary carer and that's the way things are structured in kind of a Muslim family, really. But then I also wanted to talk about the woman as non-entity as well. And, um, you know... It's a strange kind of, again, we've talked about this kind of, these strange kind of, this ambivalence about 
female ambivalence kind of in, in you know in Islam, you know. And um so on the one hand you've got this this role, this female role, and then you've got, you know, um well multiple roles really. As you said, you, you have to please the husband, please the mother, you know, it's kind of like um, and I, I, I spotted some um, uh, interest in hadiths, you know. Um, so, for example, the woman, this is from the hadith, um, the woman who dies and with whom the husband is satisfied will go to paradise. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, um, another one was, um, what was it? The other one was, the entire woman is an evil and what is worse is that it is a necessary evil. So, yeah, women as evil. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I wonder what you think about that. Oh, I... That sounds really bad. <laughs> um, that's all I have to say about that. Um, I think some people... Uh, I used to get really knee deep into the hadith and what are um, accurate sources and what are likely to be fabricated hadiths. So I won't go into that, but um, these hadiths are quite familiar to me. And um, they were also used as tools to get me to obey to my husband. Like one of the hadiths, for example, that was drilled into my head was um, like something about uh, the angels cursing me yeah. um, till the very next day if I refuse my husband. And I remember, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, like, I, d I don't know what, what it was about me, but I remember thinking, let them curse me. I don't believe you first and for foremost, but also I don't, I, I just, I don't believe in the way that these people want me to practice the religion. Therefore, I am going to reject it entirely and start over. And that's what I ended up doing. Good for you. Okay, cool. Thanks. That one was thrown at me. And also, there's also a hadith about if a man is covered in like um, pus and boils and all sorts of wounds. And if his wife was to lick him, oh. lick his wounds clean. Oh, yes, girl. Lick his wounds clean from top to bottom. She yeah, still yeah. wouldn't, she still wouldn't be worthy of him. Like she still wouldn't have, she still wouldn't be able to sort of. Um, I'm familiar with that. Worthy yeah, yeah, of his, yeah. yeah, of what he does for her or whatever. So yeah, it's quite a few of those that get spat in your face to remind you your place. Yeah. Um, so we have, Paula here says, fun fact, Islam claims to defend the family, but actually it destroys the family. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Paula? What, what, what's making you say that? No? Okay. <laughs> um, I think that I can see what you're saying if I look at it from the perspective of it was different for Dalal, but for me, it was the religion is what severed the family for me. So like when my mom saw me without wearing hijab, it was like, oh, your next step is to not be a Muslim. And so therefore I can't let you live. You can't be my spawn. I can't be responsible for having an infidel daughter. So it's like they choose the religion over their children. Yeah, actually, I had that experience as well um, when I took off the hijab. And um, so, yeah, I took out the hijab after my mother and I left each other. But um, after moving to Ireland as well, 2013 was the last time that I saw my siblings as well because my mom had custody of them and she cut me off from them because I was disobedient to her. And a disobedient daughter is destined to hell. And like my presence around my siblings it, to her in her mind is like a an infectious disease or a virus that they might catch and she was hell-bent on not um allowing my siblings to uh, follow in my footsteps uh so yes i had uh, 
that kind of um, reaction from her as well. Um, interestingly, she allowed me to recontact my siblings when I first kind of, uh, one of my videos kind of sort of trended and it was the story, my life story and what led me to um, move and um, stay in Ireland. Uh, after she saw that video when I was basically spilling the beans on my family life, um, she let me reconnect with them uh, under the condition of me taking the video down. Uh, mm. So I cut the video for several months in hopes of like actually mending the relationship between her and I and maybe starting a new chapter. That did not happen. I caught on to her like devious narcissistic ways quite quickly. And luckily I did not delete the video. I just privated it and then just sent it back live again. Um, it's so, it's so odd. How can you, yeah. So I, I don't know, it couldn't have been true love if you were to disown um, or cut off all ties with your child because what, they took off the hijab? How is, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate or register with me. Mm -hmm. It's definitely it's conditional, conditional yeah. love. Did I cut somebody off just now? Was somebody saying something? Uh, Mishir, uh, my video is in Arabic. It's called uh, Dalal's story, Qasla Dalal. It's on my YouTube channel. Thank you. Go ahead, Lois. First, thank you so much, Dalal, for telling your story. It's amazing. <laughs> and I was just wondering, to what extent do you attribute the sanity that you found to your uh, nanny that you had in your in your formative years tremendous amount i think i and my maybe i owe it all to her because if she wasn't around i would have been abused from the day i was born um deprived of any kind of love and nurture and affection i, I don't know of anyone or it's my fate would have been sealed as a, I don't know, a mentally deranged person or someone with serious um, mental issues for the rest of my life. But Selma coming into my life when she did and staying as long as she did um, during those key years from infancy to early childhood definitely contributed to my sanity today. Um, my ability to express compassion and love and want something better from for girls who have been through what I've been through as well. Thank you. I'm just going to read out a couple of comments here. Uh, Nomi says we take Western civilization for granted. We shouldn't. I agree with that for sure. Um, and Manan said before, she left, rising feminists out of forgotten ones. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for these Zoom talks. Women are a source of aura and blessing light on human civilization's existence. Well, I agree with that too. <laughs> um, and Sahara left a really nice comment here. She's saying that you're, she's glad that you're safe and at peace and at home and congratulations on your freedom, respect and admiration to all girls fighting for yourselves, especially for your freedom. Congratulations to the Haram Beautiful Life. <laughs> no. They went to that. They went to that. The tattoos, the power of the things. Yeah. <laughs> and back was tops. <laughs> um, hopefully you get an opportunity to listen to Sahara's uh, interview here on Forgotten Feminists too, because she is an amazing woman that's been through so much and has persevered, you know, beyond all expectations of humanity. She's just, um, she's phenomenal. Um, so I just wanted to wrap it up because we're on the hour. So before I do, I just wanna make sure that nobody else has any questions that I'm not going to be um, shutting it down too early. Ms. Sherrick, was that your hand sort of going up? No, okay. 
Okay, great. Um, and Dilal, was there anything that you wanted to say before we wrap up? Anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't mention or if you want to give a shout out to your YouTube? Um, you guys are fighting the good fight. Um, thank you very much also for being here. And um, uh, yeah, just uh, share my YouTube video. Most of, I think all of my videos are in Arabic because I get a res I, when I first came out with that one video about my story, the feedback that I got, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of messages by women um, who are like, oh my gosh, Dada, I thought I was the only one. Dada, you, would have, you, you can hardly, like, you wouldn't believe that my story is nearly identical to yours. And that comment, it's nearly identical to yours, kept coming up over and over and over, um, which led me to share more videos about more, um, other bits of my experience, I delved into my forced marriage. I delved into uh, what it meant to be. I was diagnosed with PTSD. Surprise, surprise. Um, so I tried to educate other women by um, talking to them about what it was like for me to have these symptoms and how they manifested. Um, and just I used the video, the channel, as a way of reaching out and telling other women you are not alone. And the f it, it all it's all worth it when I get a message from a girl who's like, oh, Dalal, um, I saw one of your videos and uh, I mustered the courage to do this. That I have now left this family. I've left this man. Man, I've left the city um, thanks to you. Really, she just heard what she needed to hear at the right time, and it was all her effort and it was all her strength. So. Um, Let's continue sharing our stories. It has a tremendous impact, more than we can even ever imagine. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, sorry, uh, Dilal, I was born in Saudi Arabia, so I do speak Arabic. I already found you and I'm gonna make sure I watch. Perfect. I think you have a very similar story. Um, is your husband a pastry chef? Yes. Uh, okay. Chocolatier. He's got a company here in our Ireland, Arcane Chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Okay. My I'm husband, sure is, husband a is a Oh, really? A chocolatier? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we do. We do have. I feel like we went through the same thing throughout the same time. It's just. <laughs> <and same difference. laughs> <laughs> never believe how close, much your story is nearly identical to mine. Oh my gosh, right yeah, there. There you go. So I'm definitely going to check out your YouTube and watch and I will have a smile on my face throughout the whole time because you said big fuck you to everyone who said you <laughs> should go with the rules and everything and you dare to live your life. Amen to that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dalal. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for sharing your light. And I will definitely have a link to your YouTube channel in the, um, in the description of this video. Thank you again. You are wonderful. I really, really appreciate you. I honor you and I love you. And thank you everybody for joining us here today. And we'll see you at the next Forgotten Feminists. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.